What's up, y'all? This is In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. Tonight, what does more crime mean for the future of police reform? Then, a little 8-bit history on a pandemic's second wave. I can't promise this will be as fun as your third rewatch of Hamilton on Disney+, Plus, but it'll cost less. Here's what you need to know. Nearly 130,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the U.S. as Texas and Florida deal with a surge in cases. To try and contain the spread, Miami-Dade County is closing party venues, fitness centers, short-term rentals, and all restaurants with the exception of takeout and delivery services. After statewide reopenings over the last several weeks, Florida is recording record high case numbers. This is a probably a two decade shift from where we were with the median age um, at the end of March, beginning of April. We had been in the 60s, then in the 50s. And then as this upswing has really been driven uh, by a lot of people in their 20s and 30s uh, testing positive. The U.S. is up there with Brazil, Sweden, and Peru as the nations with the fastest growing virus rates in the world. And we're still learning more about COVID-19. An open letter signed by more than 230 scientists calls on the World Health Organization to acknowledge publicly that the coronavirus can float in the air on droplets. Those scientists say it's now clear the virus is carried on droplets coming out of your mouth or nose. Again, folks, please just wear a mask around people. The virus traveling in droplets through the air might not sound like big news given all we've heard about it already, but the WHO and other global health groups have been hesitant to use words like airborne to describe the virus. The scientists signing on to this letter hope it can push the WHO to reverse its recommendations. And as the White House race heats up, the Supreme Court is weighing in on electoral college votes, telling states they can set laws that keep electors from going rogue. Even though the electoral college is made up of actual people who directly elect the president, those people traditionally just cast their votes for whichever candidate wins their state. But in the last election, 10 voters tried to give their vote to someone other than their state's favorite candidate. That's a big deal because it could seriously impact who wins the presidency. Many states have laws to discourage this action, but no one has actually been punished because of it. Today's unanimous 9-0 decision from the court allows states to crack down. Across the country, at least six children were killed by gunfire this weekend, putting a new spotlight on the age-old issue of gun violence in the U.S. It's a shame that uh, kids can't be out here playing um, without worrying about people shooting and doing nonsense. The kids' ages range from 6 to 14. In Atlanta, a $10,000 reward is being offered to get information on the shooting death of an 8-year-old. At least 25 people were shot in Atlanta over the July 4th weekend. Four of those victims died. In Chicago, nearly 80 people were shot and 15 people were killed. That violent weekend has people talking about guns in America but it's also colliding with ongoing conversations around police reform. So what does defunding police mean for cities' ability to counter the kind of violence seen over the last few days? Newsy's Jamal Andrus dug into that question. Across America, the holiday weekend meant more than celebrations and fireworks. For most of the nation's biggest cities, gun violence arrived right at their doorstep. In Chicago, at least 15 people were killed, including a seven-year-old girl playing outside her grandmother's home. We cannot allow this to be normalized in this city. We cannot get used to hearing about children being gunned down in Chicago every weekend. More than 60 people were shot, including 11 minors just this weekend. Over the last three weeks, nine children have died from gun violence. When you're in this culture, there are certain, certain coping skills and some mannerisms that you have to develop in an effort to survive. Cedric Friesen is an outreach worker with Ready, a violence prevention organization in Chicago. So there's certain boundaries that I have to set. And then if you cross that, I have to do, I have to follow the rules. Like, like I have to follow the rules. Okay, you, you have crossed the line with me, right? And to make that right, I need to show everybody that I don't play. Right. And again, it's nothing real new about this, but it has intensified. Studies show violence in large metropolitan areas tend to increase in the summer months. With warmer weather and more people outside, there's more opportunity for victimization and conflict. But according to criminologist Thomas Apt, what we're seeing this summer is a confluence of several factors. We are uh, really in some ways in a in a perfect storm in that uh, we have all of the various kinds of fallout uh, that is happening in response to the unrest triggered by the tragic death 
of George Floyd, uh, combined with the exhausted capacity of uh, public resources and, and people under great strain from COVID-19. Some elected officials and community members have taken this opportunity to push back on efforts to reform or defund the police. But at believes police mistrust is actually a big part of this spike in violence. When people lose trust and confidence in the criminal justice system, they stop using it. They stop calling 911. They stop giving information to law enforcement. Police violence is linked to and can contribute to community violence. And so one of the things that we need to understand is that if we want to keep our communities safe, we have to avoid these situations uh, like the death of George Floyd. After three years of decline, shootings in Chicago were up 42% compared to 2019, and homicides have risen by 32%. Other big cities, including Minneapolis, Baltimore, and Los Angeles, have seen an uptick in violence, while lawmakers have either passed or promised major changes to the city's local police force. New York, which just cut a billion dollars from the NYPD budget, has seen a 53% increase in shooting victims this year compared to last year. For people whose lives are directly impacted by this, they are impacted by both police violence and community violence, and they need relief from both. And that's really what they want. And I worry that activists and you know people who are traditionalists really only want, only want to talk about one side of the equation. But if you're living this, you desperately need relief from both. Jamal Andrus, Newsy, Chicago. Here's a hint of what we'll be covering when you're back. Uh, sure. Memes and cat videos are fun, but actual news might be a bit more useful. Follow Newsy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get straightforward, opinion-free news right on your social news feed. COVID-19. Newsy wants to hear from you about how much your treatment costs. Whether your bill was big or small, share your cost of COVID story by going to Newsy.com slash bills. Think of the internet as your grimy but lovable neighborhood dive bar. And I'm the bartender guiding you through what's on tap. Here's what we've got today. Spaghetti Western fans are mourning the loss of the maestro, Ennio Morricone, who died today at 91. The Oscar-winning Italian composer created musical soundscapes for gangster movies like The Untouchables and Once Upon a Time in America, but is probably best known for this right here. Yeah, that's still a bop. Morricone produced more than 400 scores for feature films during a career that spanned decades. Honestly, we usually try to avoid mudslinging like this, but it's got people talking and it's tough to ignore considering the source. Bubba Wallace's name is trending after President Trump attacked him on Twitter, saying that he should apologize for the whole noose controversy, which he called a hoax. If you remember, NASCAR alerted Wallace's team to a garage pull that was fashioned as a noose. Authorities determined that there wasn't a hate crime, but that didn't stop other drivers from rallying around Wallace, who's the only black full-time racer. Even in the midst of a crisis, the president has been consistent in his criticism for black athletes, especially black athletes who are vocal about race and social justice. As if we didn't have enough to worry about already, bubonic plague is trending because a hospital in northern China reported a single case over the weekend. This is the same plague, also known as the Black Death, that killed 60% of Europe's population in the 14th century. The good news? Even though it is the most common plague, it can be treated with antibiotics. The patient who contracted the case is being treated and is in stable condition. Remember that supposed baby boom that everyone was expecting when quarantine started? Turns out that hasn't exactly been the case. Bianca Vashini shows us why it may not be coming after all. The country's biggest age demographic, millennials, are having children at a lower rate than previous generations. There are a few reasons for this. One, the 2008 recession. An estimated 2 million fewer babies were born from 2008 to 2013 because of it. Second, COVID-19. As Americans grapple with a pandemic causing a health and economic crisis, another steep decline in the birth rate is underway. 
people uh, have less security knowing when their next paycheck's coming from or that they'll have a job long term. A new poll from Newsy and Ipsos shows that 43% of millennials and Gen Zers said the pandemic has made them less likely to have kids. And 42% who already have at least one child say they're now less likely to have more. You just kind of want to be sharing that joy with everyone and you're not able to. Lauren Baker found out she was pregnant just weeks after President Trump declared a national emergency. Although it's an exciting time for her, she also says it's been lonely, sharing the news with her loved ones via FaceTime and going to ultrasound appointments without her husband. It's a really weird feeling not being able to nest the way I feel like you normally would. While some states were recently working on reopening, another spike in cases led many of those plans to be paused. And millions of Americans remain out of work, leading many economists to predict a slow recovery ahead. But experts say there are still some positives that could come from this. And people are spending a lot more time together, so they may have more opportunities to try to have a child. With remote work eliminating long commutes and time spent at the office, some families might be able to take advantage of this time, especially if challenges like lack of paid leave or sky-high childcare costs pose less of a problem. But it's not expected to solve every issue facing family planning financial stress, um, increasing inequality within families and within the United States plays a big factor. Bianca Fischini, Newsy, Washington. While I have you, feel free to hit us up using the hashtag Newsy in the loop. I might not pick up the phone, but I'm always on Twitter. Every patient was a dollar sign. It wasn't about how well was the treatment done. It was about how much did you make on that treatment. On a personal basis, I've watched them drilling perfectly healthy teeth. I do not think I was an aggressive dentist. Losing your perfectly healthy teeth. How dare you try to do that to me? We're not really sure that Wall Street is the best place to make medical decisions for us. Nothing's wrong with making money if you're doing it ethically. Absolutely not. The risk of a second wave for COVID-19 was always a real one. You think you're out of the woods, life gets too normal too quickly, and then you've got another spike on your hands. And given where we're at right now, it's hard to argue that that's not what's happening. Newsy's virology series has been breaking down this pandemic from day one, including in this next piece that looks at what history has to teach us about a virus's second spike. You don't make the timeline. The virus makes the timeline. By now, you're familiar with the phrase, flatten the curve. Flatten this curve. Flattening of the curve. Depress the curve. As the pandemic of 1918 spread across the United States, some cities like Philadelphia carried on as normal and saw a spike in cases. Others, like St. Louis, closed businesses and schools and avoided that spike. But in 1918, another city presented another lesson that showed the dangers of lifting quarantine too soon. On the question of when coronavirus quarantines should come to an end, what happened to the city of Denver, Colorado a century ago could serve as a warning. October 1st, 1918. Even while several in the city are hospitalized due to flu-like symptoms, Denver's public health manager denies that the city has any cases related to the pandemic. By October 6th, the flu has overtaken the city. City officials scramble to institute a mandatory closure of all public places, except essential businesses. Over the coming two weeks, the curve begins to rise as more and more deaths are reported around the city. But by October 20th, the curve appears to crest and the death rate begins to drop. Health officials in the city begin to think their battle with the flu is over. The mayor and business owners become increasingly eager to reopen. And after another week of decreasing numbers, Denver reopens on November 10th. The next day, World War I ends. With all restrictions on distancing lifted, thousands flock to the streets for an Armistice Day celebration. But the pandemic was far from over in Denver. No more than 10 days later, signs that the city opened back up too soon became clear as the death toll rises again. In an attempt to combat the second spike in cases, Denver officials try to close the city back down, but businesses refuse. More and more cases overtake the city, and tensions grow between the city and its businesses. Meanwhile, without much evidence, the mayor and health officials start to blame immigrants from Italy and Eastern Europe for the second rise in cases. 
Ultimately, the second peak of Denver's battle with the 1918 pandemic results in even more deaths than the first spike in cases. It was worse than the first because there just wasn't the will to implement another round of, of closure orders. Business owners were not going to stand for another closure order. Dr. Navarro is a medical historian whose research team at the University of Michigan is responsible for much of what we know about the 1918 Spanish flu. I think that the real lesson is not necessarily for public health officials who know this already. I think the real lesson of Denver is for the general public who can, we can say, this is what happens when you don't keep these non-pharmaceutical interventions in place for long enough. There were lots of public health officials, lots of physicians who were telling the public we're going to be through this in a week. They were trying to sort of impose or at least give the information to the public that they were the ones who were, who were in control of the disease. And that was definitely not the case. We're always behind in terms of the data. They were behind in 1918. Uh, we're behind today. Next up, masks are making life tough for one community in particular, but there is a fix. There's three American girls competing for the top two Olympic spots. I could go into this and come out with nothing. By now we know that face masks are a super important and easy way to slow the spread of COVID-19. But we also know just how tough it can be to communicate when you've got one on, especially for people who often rely on lip reading like the deaf or hard of hearing. Newsy's Kat Sandoval shows us how some folks are getting creative to solve that problem. With more people wearing masks now in the interests of public health, some say it's worth considering masks with clear windows where people can see your lips. Since masks like this already muffle our voices, Window masks are especially helpful for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. It's important to me because I rely on lip reading so much to be able to get information. Nicole Hausman is deaf. She finds going to the grocery store one of the hardest places to navigate now that everyone wears a mask when shopping. She hasn't seen anyone wearing a window mask, but says it would help. I don't bother asking anybody questions when they're wearing face masks because I know there's no chance of understanding them. Now, if they had a clear mask on, I would be able to talk to the person, to an employee, and ask for help. Hausman says if she does need to communicate, she writes on a piece of paper for others to read. Approximately 48 million people have some degree of hearing loss. A spokesman from Gallaudet University, one of the top universities for deaf and hard of hearing, said window masks do make it possible to speech read or lip read and to see facial expressions, both with speech and with American Sign Language. They also clarified that while these masks can help, not everyone who is deaf or hard of hearing are skilled at lip reading since there are many factors at play. Sky Kubakub is a fashion designer who specializes in gender non-conforming clothing centered around the LGBTQ community and people with disabilities. Kubakub started adding window masks to their fashion line and asked for feedback on the prototype. I sent a bunch of the, the window pane masks to a friend of a friend who is deaf and they were just like so happy because, and I guess that they said that they cried because they were so happy that they could like, you know, see people's faces. In addition to window mask, Kubaku is exploring ways to improve face coverings. A lot of times the fabric ties might not be accessible to folks who don't have like fine motor skills or who just like can't raise their hands above their head for that long. The ear loops, if you don't have ears or like if you don't have one ear, having these uh, snaps and Velcro versions just are like a lot simpler. Alicia Austin teaches infants and children who are deaf and hard of hearing. When you take away that volume from somebody who's already using some sort of technology or overcompensating on their own, it makes it incredibly difficult to carry on a conversation. Children, regardless of hearing abilities, need to see facial expressions and recognition in order to learn. Austin wears her mask during her Zoom calls, so her students will get used to them when she finally sees them in person. It kind of looks silly, so we've 
we've done some of that play, putting it on bears, putting it on me. The children are wearing them so that when we do get together, it won't be as bad. She also says there are more benefits to window mask. Think about using a, a clear mask for grandparents who might have diminished hearing and don't even realize how much they rely on that face-to-face -face interaction to understand. Kat Sandoval, Newsy. The coronavirus has dominated the airwaves since this pandemic started earlier this year. But you might have also noticed some more political messaging taking up more TV time as we get closer to November. This next story from Newsy's Nathaniel Reed shows us how the White House race is playing out in political advertising. Biden is clearly diminished. All men and women created. I won't traffic in fear and division. We are seeing more advertising in 2020 than we had seen in 2016. According to new data released by the Wesleyan Media Project, during the seven-week period from May 11th to June 28th, Joe Biden spent over $3 million on television ads, airing them over 3,000 times. Add in super PAC dollars and pro-Biden TV spending swells to over 15 million. The outside groups have come, you know, are active on both sides, but much more heavily are, are favoring Biden. And even if we include those, um, Trump still has a large on-air advantage in most media markets. Sure enough, in the same period, President Trump's campaign spent upwards of $31 million and aired ads over 50,000 times, with outside groups contributing another over 10,000 airings of pro-Trump ads. 2020 uh, has shaped up to be a banner year for political advertising overall. In the last month, President Trump's most run ad, So Wrong for So Long, portrays Biden as weak on China. What a beautiful history we wrote together. And casts President Trump as the jobs president. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Meanwhile, Biden's most run ad focuses on leadership. The country is crying out for leadership. Leadership that can unite us. Leadership that brings us together. It doesn't even mention President Trump by name. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. According to data from Advertising Intelligence, the Trump campaign runs a greater variety of ads than Biden, running at least nine different ones the past month, versus only three unique ads by the Biden campaign. And Biden tends to run less negative advertising than President Trump so far. He doesn't need to. People already have pretty fixed opinions about Donald Trump. Joe Biden, even though he's longtime career in politics, Barack Obama's vice president, still needs to re reintroduce himself to the American people. In a polarized world, these ads are meant to appeal to the most general audience possible. Local TV uh, still remains one of the best ways, if not the best way, to reach a geographically specific audience and to have broad reach. Nathaniel Reed, Newsy, Washington. That's it for us, folks. Until next time, I'm Christian Bryant, and you have successfully completed In The Loop, earning you 10 loop bucks redeemable at any In The Loop franchise store. Spend them wisely. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. Stay tuned for more top stories from Newsy.